Good morning. Welcome back. Today we begin chapter 13. What's chapter 13? Chapter 13 is the answer to a question that was asked in chapter one. In chapter one, we asked, it says in the Gemara that before a soul is born, the angels in heaven make him take an oath and make him swear that he will be a tzaddik and that he will not be a rasha. And that, the second half of the oath is, even if the whole world will say to you, you're such a tzaddik, then um, you should still view yourself like a rasha. A very funny story. There is a derogatory term in Yiddish that is spelled pei tzaddik. And in most cases, a human being doesn't even say the word because it's quite crass. Um, my grandfather, was, that's Rabbi Gordon, was a rav in Maplewood, New Jersey. And the president of his show was a sweet old Jew. And when the grandkids would come, the, uh, the, the president would go on and on about the virtues and the specialness of the Zayda. And he used to say things like, your Zayda is so special, your Zayda is this, that, and the other thing. And one time, my brother was there and um, the, the president said, your Zayda is a tzaddik. And my grandfather laughingly said, and that's not the whole story. The whole story is that I'm a paid tzaddik. <laughs> He turned it from a compliment to something self-effacing. Self so the, the whole world is saying to you, you're a tzaddik, and you're supposed to say to yourself, I should not accept the notion that I am a tzaddik, even if the whole world tells me so. That's part of the oath that the neshama was made to take before you were even born. Question. The Mishnah says, don't view yourself like a Rasha. Because one of two things will happen. Either you could become depressed or you could become callous. If you become depressed, you won't serve Hashem properly. And if you become callous, you won't serve Hashem at all. That, for those reasons, the Mishnah says, do not view yourself as a Rasha. Um, how does that align with the oath that the Gemara says that the angels in heaven administer to the soul before you're born? That is the question that the Alta Rebbe will address here in chapter 13. And it begins, uh, it's built on the foundation of what we learned in chapter 12. So briefly, let's review. What did we learn in chapter 12? We said that a Bainini is a person in whom the Yetzir Hara still has an opinion. The evils of the animal soul still voice their wishes. Yes? But because of the virtue, because of the strength, because of the fortitude of the Benini, the Yetzir Hara never gets his wish fulfilled. Not in thought, not in speech, and certainly not in action. So, no, however, so then we said, why wouldn't, the, why, we, why, why wouldn't we call such a person a tzaddik? And the answer is because in the tzaddik, the Yetzir Hara, the evils of the animal soul don't even have a voice. And here in the Benini, the evils of the animal soul, the Yetzir Hara has a voice, just we never listen to him. Now, an interesting thing that the Rebbe points out a distinction between chapter 12 and chapter 13, that you'll notice that we're talking about two different levels of Bainini. Remember a long time ago, we shared a story that the Alter Rebbe told 
a certain chassid, I am a Benini. And the chassid said, then what am I? I'm certainly not a Russia. And the Alta Rebbe said, there are 400 levels of Benini. So there are levels. Okay. In chapter 12, we're talking about a Benini who is on fire. We're talking about a Benini who's inspired. We're talking about a Benini whose mind and even to a certain degree, his heart is filled with Hashem, focused on Hashem. And therefore, the result is that not only does the Yetzir Hara not influence the behavior of the person, but the Yetzir Hara is basically mute. He has an opinion and he is there, but he doesn't, you know, he, you ever been in a conversation with somebody and there is no opening for you to say a word? That's what it's like with the Yetzir HaToiv and the Yetzir Hara in this inspired Benoni. The Yetzir HaToiv goes on and on and on about the greatness of Hashem and about the importance of Torah and Mitzvahs and the Yetzir Hara never has a chance to say a word. This is the inspired Benoni. When does the, when does the Benoni experience such inspiration? During davening. Because during davening, you have a special assistance from heaven when the, you have to go back and review it at length. But in short, the time for davening is a time for inspiration and the Benini takes advantage of it and therefore is inspired to such a degree that the Yetzir Hara falls silent. And even after the davening is over, even after there is no more profound inspiration, still, the mind of the Benini is preoccupied with Hashem and the opinion of the, of the evils of the animal soul, the opinion of the Yetzir Hora does not have access to the thought processes of the Benini. However, in chapter 13, we will notice that we're talking about a Benini who is not even under the influence of a profound davening experience. How do we know this? Because you'll, know, you'll see in the way that the Alter Rebbe is describing this new Benini, that the influence, the opinion of the Nefesh HaBahamis, the evils of the animal soul, the opinions of the evils of the animal soul are in fact reaching the mind. They are reaching the mind of the Benini. And the Benini has to deal with them when they have already taken up residence in the mind of the Benini. That's a different level of Benini. And therefore, the tools for this Benini to use to always be successful are going to be different than the tools of the Benini in chapter 12. So as we go through the beginning of this chapter and we're describing what kind of Benini this is, and we're describing the struggle that he has to face, we will also try to identify what are the different tools that Hashem has put at this person's disposal to help them be successful in their mission of overcoming the evils of the animal soul at every turn. Having described the Benini as being one with two voices inside, that on the one hand, he has absolute control over his behavior, meaning his divine soul has absolute control over his behavior. But on the other hand, he has a very vocal and active and perfectly healthy animal soul uh, and the evils of the animal soul are as they were when he was born, um, we realize that the Benini is no tzaddik. That Benini is different than tzaddik. And this is reminiscent of what the Alter Rebbe told us, a quote from the Gemara in Brachas, that a tzaddik is ruled by his divine soul. And the Rasha is ruled by his animal soul. And the Benini is judged by both. To be more precise, tzaddikim are ruled or are judged by their yetzer toiv. Rishaim are, ru are judged by their yetzer hara. And the Benini is judged by both. Question. When we say judged, what do we mean? Let's read. Chapter 13, I hope everybody has a copy of Tanya in front of them. It's very helpful. Accordingly, we could understand the, the meaning of a rabbinic statement in the Gemara and Brachas, 
when it says Beinunim, that the average human being, even the average human being that has reached the highest that the average human being can reach, ze veze shoiftan, this one and that one are judging him, pirush, meaning yetzer toiv v'yetzer hara, meaning his good inclination is judging him and his evil inclination is judging him. How does the Gemara know that there is a person in the world who is judged by two forces instead of just one? And when, and when the sages are asking, from where do you know? They're asking, where in the Torah does it say? Because it says in a Pasuk, Ki ya min evyoin, because Hashem stands to the right of the poor, of the, uh, of the poor man, to save him from those who rule his soul. This is a quote from Tehillim, chapter 109. And David HaMelech is describing that Hashem is standing beside the needy, the person that is in need of help and support, to save him from those who are judging his soul. People are judging his soul. Practically, it means, practically it means that the world is a hard place and Hashem is helping those who are in need. Spiritually, it means, the Alter Rebbe explains, that you have a human being who is judged by both internal forces. His soul is under the influence of, in other words, two souls. There are two judges in his soul, so to speak. There's the Yetzir Atoiv, who's judging him and in trying to influence him to do good. And there's the Yetzir Hara, who's judging him and trying to influence him to do the opposite of good. And... Uh, and the Alter Rebbe points out, Veloy Omerim, you'll notice the sages were very careful not to say, Zeveze Moishalim Chas Veshalom, that the two forces, that they both rule over the Beinuni. The two forces do not rule over the Beinuni. The two forces merely sit in judgment over the Beinuni. Why? Key because Kishayesh is a Shalito Mem Shalal Yetzer Hara. If at any time the Yetzer Hara would gain actual control over the Ir Ketano, the small city, meaning the body, mind, uh, thought, speech, and action of the person, even if it were for the shortest moment, Nikre Rasha the Benini would be called no longer a Benini. The Bainani would descend to the level of imperfect average human being. An average human being who has failed once in a while. And because we are describing in the Bainani, the category of Bainani is the average human being who has not failed in thought or speech or action, is consistently doing, thinking and saying correct things, important things, valuable things, uh, if the Yetzir Hara, if the evils of the animal soul were to gain control even for one moment, he would lose the status of Benuni. So that's not possible. And that's why the sages in their description of the Benuni's internal dynamic of being judged by two forces, they're careful not to say that he is ruled over by two forces. Because when you say rule, it means I have the power to enact a decree that has to be obeyed. A judge doesn't have that power unless there's only one judge. Sometimes, sometimes you have a halachic dilemma. So you go to a halachic judge. And the halachic judge makes a ruling. And that ruling has to be obeyed. We have stories, there are some beautiful stories about people who take fellow human beings to court and they just bring them to the Rav of the city. They don't go to a base din of three judges. They just go to the Rav of the city whom they honor and they respect and they, and they, will, they commit to listen to him. So that when he lays down his, his own ruling just by himself, he makes a ruling, then all the parties have committed to obey. That is when you have one judge. When you have one judge, then the opinion of that judge must be obeyed. But uh, if you have two judges, what do you do? Well, you, 
you can't practically have two judges because if one judge says yes and one judge says no, then there's nowhere to go from there. And therefore, the next available number of judges is three. Because one judge will say yes, one judge will say no, and the third judge will be the decider. So in the tzaddik, when we say, quoting the Gemara, the Gemara, the sages said that, uh, that the tzaddik is judged by his divine soul. That means that in the tzaddik, the edicts of the divine soul are obeyed because there is not an opposing judge. There is only one opinion. Whereas in the Russia, in the wicked person, what's a Russia? What's a wicked person? We're not, God forbid, talking about horrible, awful, sinful people. We're talking about average human beings who fail on occasion. Some more frequently and some less so. In the case of a Russia, there are occasions where the impulse to do evil gains control, stands unopposed in the mind and heart of the Russia, where the Yetzir Hara says, let's do this, and the Yetzir Hatev says nothing. When that happens, well, then the edict of the animal soul is obeyed because there is not an opposition. There is no opposing opinion. Of course, when you have two opinions, now there's a new dynamic inside of the court. Because now the question is, between the two opinions, which one of them will gain the upper hand? We don't want our courts to work that way. We don't want two judges fighting with each other to gain control. Instead, we bring in a third judge and that judge will rule and will go according to the majority. The majority opinion will win. And this way there's no fighting and everybody will walk away. Who is the third judge in the case of the Benoni's internal court? So let's see how the inner dynamic works. Ki, sorry, Elo, rather. Hayetzer hara enoi rak al derech moshol. The Yetzer hara's position inside the Benoni is not one of control. Rather, it is It's like a judge um, who expresses his opinion in a case of law, a legal question. How should we act? The Yetzir HaToy voices his opinion. The Yetzir HaRa voices his opinion. So here you have in the Benini, the Yetzir HaRa, the evils of the animal soul are expressing their opinion about how the Benini should act. And yet, it's possible that in actuality, the practical result will not be according to the opinion of this judge. Because there is another judge who is dissenting. There's a dissenting view. And somebody's going to have to come in and decide between the two of them. It says in the Gemara, Chazal rule, Chazal described, it's not a separate rule, it's logical, but the Chazal described with these words, that whenever there is a debate between two judges, you bring in a third judge, and the Halacha will follow the third judge, and that third judge is called the Machriya. So too, so too, we find that the Yetzer Hara, the evils of the animal soul, voice their opinion there in the left side of the heart. And from the heart, the decision of the animal souls, uh, the Yetzer Hara, the evils of the animal soul, rise to the mind of the Benoni, to be considered. And immediately, the other judge is dissenting, is arguing against the opinion of the animal soul. This here is the new dynamic in the Benini that we did not see in chapter 12. 
In chapter 12, we are describing a Yetzir Hara that is silent. He has no opinion. And as soon as his opinion tries, as soon as he tries to express his opinion, and he tries to push a thought into the mind of the, of the Benuni, the Benuni pushes that thought away with both hands. Here, however, the thought rises to the mind of the Benuni, and the Benuni is choosing, he's measuring, he's weighing between the two judges. What is he weighing? Is he fantasizing how to do the sin? No, because that's a sin. Like we said at the end of chapter 12. That doesn't, that doesn't constitute an actual sin, but it has a, de a deleterious effect on the soul of the Benini and causes him not to be a Benini anymore. Here, what we are describing is not that he's fantasizing about the sin. He's trying to measure, is this the right thing or is that the right thing? Whose opinion is correct? And as soon as I figure out whose opinion is correct, I will act in that manner. The obvious example, the most obvious example is, we are told by the holy books that sometimes it's necessary to express anger. When you're raising children or you're a teacher in a classroom or you are Moses on the mountain, sometimes it's appropriate to express anger so that the, so that the children or the students or the Jewish people should understand the severity of the situation. Another example, when you're in first aid class or lifeguard school, they say generally don't raise your voice because people can't hear you when you raise your voice. They don't understand what you're saying, all they hear is yelling, yeah? But in case of an emergency, you are obligated to yell. Get right up in the face of the person and yell and scream until they obey. Isn't that a contradiction? Sometimes the situation requires that you yell. Um, right, we heard that just recently. In the case of an emergency, how do you convince people that the emergency is real? By screaming. <laughs> Sometimes they have to hear screaming. Yeah, good. Now, how do you know if the, if the situation calls for anger, if the situation calls for screaming, or if that's just the evils of your animal soul looking for a little fun? So this Benuni, and this is of course a very easy example, but anger is a terrible, terrible mida. Anger is the mida that burns you down to the ground. All the good work that you've done gets destroyed if a person expresses anger. Now, how do you avoid making the wrong choice? Well, you have the voice of the animal soul is describing, the, the voice of the animal soul is calling for anger and screaming. And the voice of the divine soul may, may, may be calling for calmness and gentle words. And the Bainani's job is to choose between the two of them. He's not considering or fantasizing about the sin. He's not entertaining sinful behavior. He's making a judgment and that requires some study. Yeah. So now, who's going to help this Benoni make the right choice? Because as soon as the Yetzir Hara's opinion comes up into the mind, the other judge, the Yetzir Atoiv, that's the divine soul, whose home is in the mind, whose influence spreads over the right side of the heart, the right side of the heart being the home for the inclination to do good. So the, the home, the seat of the divine soul is in the mind. The seat of the animal soul is in the blood. The home of the influences of the divine soul is in the mind and in the right side of the heart. And the home or the seat of the influence of the animal soul is in the left side of the heart. And the judges are arguing with each other from their perspective, from their respective seats. The halacha kedivya machiria, the law, the decision will be 
according to the opinion of the decider, the decider, who HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Originally, when we learned this, the way we learned it until now, one would have thought that the human being's intellect would be the decider, that you have two judges, and the human being would decide between the two judges. Right? Didn't we say that? We said that there's the evils of the animal soul, there's the blessings of the divine soul, and there is the human intellect that stands between them that has to make a choice. We would have expected that in the case of the Yetzir HaToyv and the Yetzir HaRa voicing their judgment, offering their opinions, that the intellect of the human being would be the one to choose between them. Why does Hashem have to step in here? Why does the Machriya have to be HaKadosh Baruch Hu? That's Hashem helping the divine soul to overpower the animal soul. As it says in the sages, as it says in the Gemara, I think this is from Gemara Kiddushin. If Hashem was not helping him, he's not able to overcome the animal soul. When it comes to the debate between these two judges, the Yetzir HaToyv and the Yetzir HaRa, Hashem is the one who's going to help the Benini reach a conclusion, uh, the correct choice, and go to follow the Yetzir HaToyv, the good inclination. That means the human being does not have control or cannot give control to the godly soul by himself without any help from, from Hashem. What we mean here is not that, not that he's not uh, strongly, that he doesn't have strong willpower or that he's wishy-washy or that he's easily overcome by the influences of the animal soul. That's not what we mean. We're talking about does the Bainani have the clarity of mind to immediately identify what is a bad idea? The answer is, which human being has the clarity of mind to easily identify what's the right, word, what's the right path? If Hashem did not give the soul, the divine soul, an easy advantage over the animal soul, we would be in a big trouble. Because both parties will present their opinion in a very convincing and logical and acceptable way. As much as the animal soul is offering a terrible option, it's always presented with great logic. It's always presented with good reasoning. I am showing my anger so that the people around me should learn a good lesson. I'm showing my anger so that my children should never repeat this behavior. I'm showing my anger so that the Jewish people should never worship a golden calf again. All good reasons. At least they sound like they're good reasons. The question is, though, is that coming from your ego or is that coming from a truly pure and altruistic place? We don't have the capacity to make the right call in every decision, in every situation. If Hashem didn't help us and give us a hand up, give the divine soul an easy advantage over the animal soul, we would, we would fail on a regular basis, even the optimal human being. Once the opinion of the animal soul reaches the mind, if it's not isolated just to your emotions, we would have a very hard time figuring out whose good logical arguments are actually correct. That's firstly. And the second thing is, the Bainani is often faced not with the, not with the urge to, uh, not with the urge to be promiscuous and to serve idols and to murder. Of course not. As we said, the Yitzhahara would, would lose that fight before it started. The Yitzhahara is not going to pick such a fight with the Bainani. Instead, what does he say? He says, you know, you had one cup of coffee today. Maybe you should have another.
And the Bainani says, well, what could possibly be wrong with another cup of coffee? And the answer is, are you indulging? If you are indulging, you are giving strength to your animal soul. If you are falling asleep and you have to work and a cup of coffee will help you function, drink a cup of coffee. If you are drinking a cup of coffee because your palate and you, because your palate wants the flavor, that's called indulgence. And we learned in the earliest parts of Tanya that even an indulgence, if it's not directed at the service of Hashem, is going to take a bainani away from the category of bainani. Ask a health fitness person, a health and fitness enthusiast, how many cups of coffee you should drink a day. So uh, aside from the fact that many of them will say, don't drink any coffee, any ever a day, those who, those who uh, will answer from a place of learning and from a place of experience and a place of knowledge will say, only what you need. Only what you need. Don't drink coffee recreationally because it leads to harm and it will undo all the benefits. The benefits are that it is the, I don't know, I'm going to make all this up. Don't, don't quote me on this. It's deoxidizing and it's the toxifying and it's the yeah and it helps with your digestion it helps with your concentration and it helps with your heart rate and but if you drink too much then you'll the system will be overwhelmed and you'll undo all the benefits same thing in spiritual in a spiritual sense how much coffee should you drink if you drink coffee your mind will be clear your body will be popping popping whether this is true or not is irrelevant if it works for you and it helps you serve Hashem, and it helps you serve Hashem, then you do it. Because it is permitted and it helps you serve Hashem. But how do you know if it's really helping you serve Hashem? A person will say, let me eat a cupcake, because cupcakes help me serve Hashem. <laughs> There's a, there is a, a, a tradition among the Jewish people to offer tikkun on the yard site of a parent. Tikkun is where you put food out on the table and people really should say lechayim. It's the lechayim really. And the wishes that the neshama should have an aliyah, that the neshama should ascend higher in, its, in the world of souls. That's the main thing. But even so, you put out food and in Chabad, the custom is you put out donuts from ungers. And, uh, and you say a bracha and you have in mind for this bracha that the bracha should be in the merit of the neshama whose yard site is today. How much donut do you need? Ask a health and fitness enthusiast how many donuts you should eat in order to honor the memory of a person whose yard site is today. The health and fitness enthusiast will tell you, since this is a religious thing, <clears throat> eat enough donuts so that you could eat, say a bracha before and a bracha after. More than that is already indulgence. If your goal is perfect health and fitness, spiritually is the same thing. How much donut do you have to eat in order to fulfill your obligation of saying a bracha on the, on the behalf of a departed soul? Exactly enough that you need in order to say a bracha before and a bracha after, and anything else is indulgence. Now, again, this section of Tanya, we have to remember, this section of Tanya is not a how-to guide. We're still just in the definition part. We're still just in the definitions. So this information sounds like a level that is very far away from where we are today. And it might be discouraging, but let's not forget. This part of Tanya is like, is like the picture on the cereal box when the cornflakes look really big and crunchy. And then you open it and it's much smaller and flaky. And there's a disclaimer on the cover of the cereal box that says image enlarged to show texture. So here the Bainani is being enlarged and we're looking at him under a microscope and he looks amazing. It looks superhuman. And we are thinking to ourselves, I can never do this. Relax. Image enlarged to show texture. How to get here, how to be a Bainani, that begins shortly, but not here. 
We're still in the description part. Now, this Bainani has an option in front of his eyes to indulge. There's a kosher food in front of him. It's not forbidden. Never mind. Anger is a, I mean, there's a risk of doing something that is absolutely forbidden. If you were showing anger in the wrong situation, that's absolutely forbidden. So there's a tremendous risk. But what if, you're, what if it's a question of a kosher donut, an extra kosher donut? Or very practically in, this, in these days, we're going to go to a Lagba Omer parade and there's going to be extra hot dogs, extra cotton candy. Everyone's invited to the Lagba Omer event at Chabad from 4 to 9 p.m. Beautiful, wonderful, bring the kids, bring the grandkids, fun for all ages. Um, how do you know if you are serving Hashem by consuming that food? And how do you know if you are just indulging your physical, you're indulging yourself in physical pleasures? That is a serious question that Bainani has to face on a regular, regular basis. Regular basis. I'll tell you, I had, I'm not a Bainani yet, but I had this dilemma this morning. I'm preparing for myself a cup of coffee. And it was one of those days. And I said, you know what? Maybe I want an extra sweet, extra sweet coffee today. So let me turn the sugar thing over one more time in the coffee. How do I judge this? Is that the animal soul encouraging me to indulge in physical pleasure? Or is this really going to help me be more enthusiastic about my day today? About the davening and the learning and the teaching that I have to do? By myself, it's very hard to know. Very hard to know. Because nobody loves me and my indulgences more than me. And nobody is more confused by them than I am. And if Hashem doesn't help, I'm going to get stuck. And I'm going to fail. And I'm going to fall. And every time I do that, my Yitzhahara gets stronger. And I get weaker. And eventually, I will fall from my position of Benini. And I will become a sub... What is it called? Suboptimal average human being called Russia. This morning, I'm convincing my kids to get dressed. Um, and I went from expressing anger to calm words back to expressing anger because I didn't know what's the right way. And in the moment, who am I, to, who am I supposed to consult? If Hashem doesn't help, uh, you know, you could express anger and you can think that that's the right thing to do. We need Hashem's help in these very delicate situations, especially and, and particularly not like the Benini of chapter 12, where the Yetzir Hara is shut down and has no voice. Here, the Yetzir Hara has already gained some access to the Senate and is voicing his opinion. So now you have to figure out whose opinion is correct. I'm hearing logic from both sides. For this, you need Hashem's help. And what, of course, is this help that Hashem provides? And Hashem does provide. And Hashem gives the, eight, gives the divine soul a, a, uh, a clear advantage over the animal soul. What is that advantage? Veho ezer he. The help is. Is the extra light that Hashem gives to the divine soul that it should have a clear advantage and control over the foolishness of that fool, the wicked inclination, the evil inclination. Remember the analogy we learned in the in the previous chapter that the that the the power that the divine soul has over the animal soul is that the divine soul comes with wisdom and the animal soul comes with foolishness. And that wisdom has an automatic and clear advantage over foolishness, just as light has an advantage over darkness. We said that if you turn on the light, there's no fight. The darkness goes away automatically, almost as if by itself. And we said that in that wisdom is the same. Wisdom is the same. When you turn on the light of wisdom in a room full of foolishness, the foolishness dissipates. 
how to describe this in words, I don't know. But we are familiar with the experience. We are familiar with the experience. We are right in the middle of some form of behavior. And we come to the realization that what we are doing is foolish. If we have an iota of discipline, the foolish behavior will stop immediately. That is if you're on or near the level of Benini. But a person who is a Russia, meaning suboptimal human being from among the levels that we described in chapter, I don't know, the 9, 10, 11, we find ourselves recognizing the foolishness of our behavior and incapable of stopping it. Incapable of stopping it. So here I am, here I am thrashing, here I am uh, lashing out at my children in anger. And then I realize, hello, you're hurting these kids. And that's the last thing in the world you want to do but I'm so riled up that I can't stop. Or, but if I change my demeanor now, they'll realize that the way I was behaving before was bad and that's gonna be embarrassing for me, so I can't stop. Or if I stop now, they will have a win over me because that will show how they are in control and I'm out of control. That's not good because I have to show my dominance and I have to make sure that they know who's in control. So I can't stop. And all the time, throughout all this, the person knows just how foolish they're being. But because they find themselves in a compromised mental situation, because of the hold that the evils of the animal soul has on their thinking, they're not, they find themselves incapable of stopping. The Bainani, on the other hand, as soon as he realizes that the opinion that he hears and, uh, and has not followed, as soon as the wisdom turns on, and Hashem helps that the divine soul comes with wisdom and the animal soul comes with foolishness. And as soon as the light of wisdom is turned on, you know beyond the shadow of a doubt what's right. You know beyond the shadow of a doubt what's right. It's not even a competition. And the advantage in the life of the Benini is that he or she is practiced at always doing what's right. That's why they are a Benini. What I'm saying is that even the Russia, even that suboptimal average human being experiences the advantage of the divine soul over the animal soul. You know beyond the shadow of a doubt what's right. If only you thought about it for two seconds, you would see clear as day, this is right, this is wrong. The advantage of the Bainani on top of the regular average, average human being is that the Bainani is practiced and rehearsed at always doing what's right. So as soon as the light of wisdom turns on in the mind of the Bainani, and that is the help that the Bainani has as a gift from Hashem, he's able to rein in all the misfortune, rein in all the misbehavior, and always only ever do the right thing. And of course, the, the commentaries and the other rabbeim, they emphasize that the chazal are saying that the Pasuk says Hashem stands to the right side of the needy person and helps him. Of course, the right side is associated with the, with the, uh, with the Yitzhar HaToyev who is found in the right side of the heart. This all leads us to one conclusion. And that is if a person intends on being a Bainani, he needs to acknowledge that not every thought that comes into his head is correct. And therefore, even if the whole world says to you, you are a tzaddik, what is tzaddik? Tzaddik means no incorrect thought enters your head. You must never think of yourself that way. 
because you'll fall prey to all the nonsense of the animal soul. Instead, view yourself like a Russia. Measure each thought very carefully. Is it correct? Is it not correct? That's key to being a Benjamin. And the Alter Rebbe will say that, we'll read the Alter Rebbe's own words as he describes that, that um, answer to the question from chapter one, God willing, next week. Thank you all for joining and have a happy Lagboma. Like